Hello, friends. Although uh, heterosexual to the highest degree, there have been two instances in my life that steered doubts as to my sexual preferences. The first occurrence was in 1984 in a public park, at a public park in the U.S., where I gave a spontaneous hug and a kiss on the cutest little cheek of my then three-year-old boy. And two elderly ladies had summoned a nearby officer to arrest me for pederasty. Luckily, I convinced the uh, officer that I was the father of the boy and that we Greeks often manifested our love towards our children in that manner. Then it is a matter of incest, judging by the way he kissed a child, shouted the elderly uh, of the two concerned ladies. Luckily, the reasonable officer appeased them on the grounds that he had many Greek friends and that such behavior was common in our culture. The second occurrence was in my hometown in Hanya, here in Crete, in the Hanya harbor of Crete, when two half-drunk English tourists inter interpreted my arm around the shoulder of a pal whom I was consoling, comforting at a time of difficulty in his life as a homosexual act. And that was dully resol uh, resolved when my already despondent friend lost control and launched his fist at the sarcastically grinning teeth of the one who had referred to us as Greek fags. Personally, I had a good laugh when I considered the source of the insult. However, there is nothing really funny about these two incidents, especially when the purest forms of human affection, of paternal love and brotherly friendship, respectively, confuse a large number of people in English-speaking cultures. Now, as to the reasons for this, well, as already explained, as I have already explained in other videos, the traumatic cultural shift of Northwestern Europeans from the Bronze Age to the more advanced civilizations of the Greco-Roman world that, was, that, that had force-fed them, uh, you know, Roman, uh, by the Roman sword culture, robbed these peoples from their own indigenous development. The consequence of which was for them to blindly embrace rules and conduct that simplified the civilized world that they could not understand and that was forced on them. Add that the, the Christian doctrine and the way it was interpreted by these people that did away with all the ritual of the Romans and the Greeks so that things could also be simplified by way of religion and Eros stifling Puritanism that followed well, Puritanism was bound to follow and produce such narrow mindsets. This mentality is easily reflected sociolinguistically, since the language of a given group of people reflects their morals and values. And since English seems to be the language the world is adopting uh, to globalize, it behooves us to juxtapose it, English that is, to the oldest and most civilized, la most civilized language in Europe which is none other than Greek, as it has evolved, without whose diction Westerners would not even be able to say telephone, let alone harmony, democracy, uh, empathy, etc. To see why the wrong values are being embraced by the linguistic influence of the West, especially through television and the mass media. Meanwhile, there is no need to juxtapose an endless list of the two languages in this case Greek and English, to come to some sort of conclusion that would explain the intellectual reasons for the aforementioned misunderstandings. This is easily achieved by comparing the way the notion of love, the singular word love, is perceived by the speakers of the corresponding languages. In this manner, we may not only be able to explain the reasons for the aforesaid inter inter misinterpretations of my intentions, but even more importantly, distinguish which civilization has more to offer by way of a dignifying form of human development, since love is the cornerstone of both humanism and humanitarianism. The Greek language, my friends, for instance, boasts at least six different words for the supreme human feeling of love. 
agape, unconditional love, general love. Eros, which cannot be interpreted in other languages, uh, which by the, in the English, English mind, mindset it is sexual love, infatuation, uh, the absolute uniting force. In fact, the word eros comes from the uh, prefix er, which means to stimulate, and it works in many derivatives within the Greek language. Philia, platonic, brotherly love. Storgi, familial or maternal, paternal love, the kind of love that uh, induced me to give a kiss to my son's cheek, associated with affection. Philotimon, this is the most difficult word to translate. It is something like love of honor and human dignity, which compels one to help one's fellow human being in need with a feeling of shame if one does not fulfill the task. Well, this is the most difficult, as I said, to translate as a notion, uh, as it semantically acts as the quintessence of Greek humanism. And and synesthesis, which in English is loosely touched upon through the borrowed use of the Greek word empathy, which meant something totally different in ancient Greek. Speakers of English who attend New Testament Greek courses find it particularly difficult to understand the distinction of these words as they appear in the Bible, because they only have one word for it, them. At this point, one could claim that friendship could represent philia, and affection could mean storgi, well, only up to a certain degree, as the Greek words function in a more dynamic semantic field, proven by the way the derivatives of philia, for instance, function to mean love, as in philosophy, love of wisdom, philologist, lover of literature, philatelist, lover of stamps, uh, philanthropist, lover of humanity. So the word philia uh, embodies the word love in it, the word friendship. In other words, the Greek word for friendship entails this meaning of love, something that reflects the gravity placed in friendship within the Greek world. In modern Greek, the very word for kiss, philo, philao, stems from philia. Greeting and parting kisses, therefore, are frequent between Greek friends of the same sex without sexual undertones. As English lacks this semantic in the word friend, it is understandable how one's arm around his body could be misinterpreted as, a, as an anomalous act by a speaker of English. Meanwhile, whereas English once again resorts to lover to refer to one's sexual relation, Greek makes a distinction with erastis, a, deriv a derivative of eros. Because you can say, you know, animal lover, and then which can be misinterpreted by the Greek studying English. As for the word storgi, it functions semantically to mean familial love, affection and compassion all in one. And it evokes such a strong feeling that it is used to refer to the kind of love God feels for humanity. Hence the adjective that we can see in the Bible, philostorgos, the one who loves to bestow storgi, compassion and affection. Its family-oriented semantic field is also emblematic of the paramount importance of the family unit in Greek societies, which is manifest with a spontaneous kiss on a tender little cheek now and then. Affection simply does not work like that in English, as it denotes something more like tenderness rather than love, hence the use of love and affection, uh, uh, hence the use of love and affection to intensify it. When contrasting this wealth of love words in Greek to the single one in English, therefore, it becomes evident that the infrastructure of English-speaking peoples and societies is greatly impoverished by way of not only expressing emotion, but also by way of manifesting it. To what is this attributed, you might ask? Well, you know, uh, we have to dig deep. This owes itself to the fact that healthy contact between human beings was greatly hindered by the circumstances the members of these societies in Northwestern Europe had to act in. As I mentioned earlier, no sooner had Britannia been wrested from the Bronze Age by the invading Romans than it was thrown into monarchies, until today, and feudalism. No indigenous culture in between, no city-states, no communities that were free to decide for themselves, and no real freedom. 
This was so because monarchy and feudalism, unlike the democracy of a Greek city-state or even a Greek village, limited human experience to that of a subject, unlike the freedom that a politis citizen enjoyed in Greece. A subject state is subject to authority. This is what we are establishing in the world today, a subject uh, of the state. So a subject of the state is subject to authority. Whilst a citizen, a politis, in the Greek sense, has an active share in his community and produces more socially cultivated people. Hence the word polite, polit, from politis, the word polite is a Greek of Greek origin, which means citizen, he who is, uh, who embodies all the elements uh, of that have fermented in a city. Since a politis behaved in a proper and responsible manner to function on equal terms with his fellow citizens. The subject, unlike the, the politis, obeys, while a politis, a citizen, has a right to question. And this is the difference. God save the queen, and I am ready to die for my president, quoted by many a U.S. Marine during the Gulf War, still resounds amongst the recipients of a submissive culture of subjects. Whereas the volatility of Greek governments here in Greece and the overthrow of monarchies and whatnot reflect the perennial sense of individual freedom amongst the heirs of free thinkers. This has always lent Greece, of course, an atmosphere of instability, an atmosphere of subterranean restlessness despite the surface conformity to the tyranny of the moment, not conducive to a globalized world, uh, uh, the, this new world order under which Greeks are currently suffering for many reasons, but it's a cultural thing also. That is not to say that a Greek is not patriotic, not willing to fight uh, and, or die in battle. On the contrary, uh, history has proven that when Greeks face a threat, a common threat to their ethnic freedom by a common foe, uh, their fierceness in battle and their unity have been unmatched throughout the past. Otherwise, Europe today would be speaking Persian or Turkish. From their victory over the invading Persians in antiquity and the war of independence against the Turks uh, to their triumph over the Italian forces in World War II, it is, it is to this day evident that the Greek is committed only to the freedom of his social hearth and the self-determination of each individual. In other words, a citizen mentality compels one to die for his family and country as opposed to that of a subject who is willing to die for a figurehead in foreign climes, as we have repeatedly seen over the past 70 years in Europe and the Middle East. A citizen who partakes in the affairs of the state socializes with his fellow human beings with an air of a truly free man who knows that his words count. It follows, therefore, that he increases his vocabulary to express the high thoughts and sentiments that celebrate this freedom. It is no wonder that to this day, conversations amongst Greeks are dominated by, the, dominated by the issues of politics, religion, and why not sex. While members of Anglo-Saxon cultures abstain from such issues as they are considered politically incorrect and taboo. This is quite understandable, as both sovereign and church for hundreds of years repressed free speech in uh, Northern Europe. Uh, thought and passion was also suppressed within Anglo-Saxon societies. Uh, let's not forget Elizabethan England, okay? People were dressed up to the neck for no skin exposure. The subjects of these powers, unlike free citizens, after a long working day in the name of their lords, withdrew home and sought quiet and solitude, something reflected in the word privacy, widely used in the English-speaking world to this day and almost non-existent among Greeks. In such a world, one of the few outlets for all of a tenant farmer could suppress was offered at the public house, the pub as we know it today. There, under the influence of drink, people would unbolt and be more social. However, what sort of high thoughts could an inebriated conversation give vent to? Things have not changed much since the Middle Ages in these societies, since alcohol continues to play a major role in almost every social interaction and occasion. 
the cliché notion of, uh, for example, of wine and candlelight being prerequisite to a romantic night out and spiked punches and alcohol a must in parties attest to all this, just as do Alcoholics Anonymous sessions. In the U.S., adolescents loitering about outside liquor stores in the hope of persuading an adult passerby to buy them some booze is a common phenomenon. Even Her Majesty's super agent James Bond upholds a tradition with his shaken but not steered martinis. At this point, one might say that Greeks have also been known to drink and in fact smash plates in the process. However, getting pissed, British for drunk, for the sake of getting pissed, is a far cry from the Dionysian element that emerges spontaneously after a hearty get-together amongst friends and food during, let's say, one's name day celebration, so often in Greece. The Greek will, will rapturously break plates in defiance of the material world, maybe, while in the realm of friends and spirits. With a few exceptions in large cities, the Greek will drink his wine with food and conversation, as it was customary in the symposiums of antiquity. The word symposium, sin and poto, that means I drink in the company of friends. So this word, which literally means a drink together, is yet another sociolinguistic element that reveals an emphasis on philia. Meanwhile, there's no, this is really interesting, there's no Greek word for bar. As to this day, it is considered abnormal for one to indulge in solitary drinking perched on a stool, contemplating bottles on the other side, with a bar between him and another person serving drinks. It is also a, f a fact that an inebriated Greek becomes jovial, unlike his Anglo-Saxon counterpart, who often becomes violent, hence barroom brawls, the latter reflecting an outlet for the repressed thoughts of a people belonging to a subdued culture. Uh, we can attest to this in the, Cre in the southern coast of Crete in Malia, where people come here and they can just let loose, no matter what the age, because they love to get drunk. Besides all this, studies have shown that private persons are more likely to become alcoholics. The phrase, I would like my privacy, resounds throughout the West, which in itself signifies the general introversion of its populaces and their need to loosen up socially via alcoholic beverages. What is particularly interesting sociolinguistically is that the word, as I said, privacy does not exist in Greek, as introversion has been frowned upon in Greek societies since antiquity. In fact, in Greek societies, as in classical Athens, one who keeps to himself and is not socially and politically active is contemptuously referred to as an idiotia, idiotia, one who withdraws to himself. The irony is that when speakers of English use the word idiot, it is a, uh, uh, it is a borrowing from the word idiotia, private person. The recipient, therefore, uh, of the term usually wears the original meaning as well. This, by all means, does not exclude many Greek idiotias, idiots, who are dangerously on the increase in large cities nowadays here in Greece, also having adopted the bar culture of the West. A society preoccupied with the notion of privacy does not offer the ideal environment for substantial friendships to root themselves in. Thus, human relations acquire a superficial you scratch your back, I'll scratch your. You, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Mentality. National bestsellers like Dale Carnegie's "How to Make Friends and Influence People," if you remember the book, and Stephen Covey's "The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People," over 10 million copies sold. Clearly indicate a society where the establishment of true friendships is not a natural process, but one that must be learned, and at that not so much for the sake of philia, brotherly friendship and love, but for exploitation. We can see this in uh, prenuptial agreements, even in a relationship as intimate as a couple getting married, there has to be business to be settled first. The loneliness that follows in absence of true friends who do not desire some kind of profit leads to a seclusion, depression and neurosis. It is not coincidental that everything has been psychiatrified, as it were, in the US and in Britain. It is common knowledge that the professional therapist functions as a family doctor in, in those societies. Group therapies come and go while 
psychiatric pills are administered like candy to children who may be simply overly active or face family, be facing family problems, something that is also extensive in Europe and is coming to us here in Greece also as well, having adopted this kind of culture. Of course, the multicultural social structure and the lack of homogeneity in Western societies greatly contribute to this since people lock themselves up inside their homes, not sure of what to expect once out there, especially at nights. And there is no cultural focus point, therefore, that would give the, the various peoples a humanistic identity, as in nation states in the past. This makes everything impersonal, as reflected in the phrase, I don't want to get involved, I don't want to get involved, which echoes throughout the countries, these countries. A common sight in large US cities is that of a man sprawling on the, on the, on the pavement after a heart attack, maybe, while people walk past him or just stand and observe for novelty's sake. Devoid of concepts, like the one mirrored in the Greek word philotimo, that which roots in this sort of society is a form of beastly individualism that literally treads upon corpses. Getting back to the exasperation that my fatherly kiss produced in these uh, aforementioned American ladies at the park, I must point out that to many, the concepts of affection and love are not easily distinguished from those of sexual intent and perversion in those climes. I specifically remember an American TV program on the subject of incest and sexual harassment, which may very well have influenced the two well-intentioned ladies. In this program, the narrator's references to incest were accompanied by images of parents simply hugging their children or stroking them on the head uh, or back in public places. I was later informed by an elementary school teacher, friend of mine, that she had been issued an official guideline not to touch children in the head lest she be sued by a parent. The effect that such broadcasts exercise on secluded members of a culture that has not delved in the various uh, facets of love that I previously mentioned is catalytically dangerous as it shapes attitudes and homogenizes thoughts. The non-existence of eros or erotas as we use it today here in Greece as it functions in Greek may very well cause the greatest confusion with regard to human relationships amongst the populaces of the Western world. Although English contains the derivatives of these words, of this unifying force, in the words erotic, erotic, or eroticism, they are strictly limited to function in the realm of sex or pornography. In Greek, however, the word eros and its derivatives act poetically to mean the stimulation of all the senses. Even the, the verb for stimulate, er ethizo, has the prefix of the word eros in it in Greek. The desire to connect, the stimulant of thought, and the impetus of passion for life itself. Its import fluctuates according to the context. When a Greek says, Izoi ine erotas, life is erotas. My friend is erotikos, or philos mu in erotikos, in his conversations. Or my aunt's cooking is eros in itself. He feels all the poetic shades and nuances of the word. To add to this, a speaker of Greek knows that Theos erotas refers to one's inexorable desire to unite with God, divine love. By contrast, the term divine love hardly suffices to fulfill the powerful nuance, for in its laborious task to cater for all the types of desire that a human can feel, the singular English word for love is rendered relatively impotent. I have chanced upon inexorable debates between students of New Testament Greek in vain trying to decipher what is meant by the use of the word eros in the biblical context of divine love, since the word eros is associated with the sexual innuendos in their mindset. It is quite oxymoronic that a form of quasi-puritanism is often used to make up for this linguistic, notional, and therefore behavioral schism and empty uh, chasm, I should say. On the one hand, the laws in the USA, for instance, uh, have secured the emancipation of women to such an extent 
that nowadays men fear to even pay an innocent compliment to a beautiful woman lest she sue them for sexual harassment and end up in court or even in prison. Whereas, on the other hand, the American film industry presents women as objects of sexual pleasure. This is apparent in TV programs where the well-endowed lifeguard, female lifeguard, indiscriminately offers mouth-to-mouth assistance or in football games where cheerleaders in soaring skirts support their teams with palpitating breasts, swaying hips, and projecting buttocks. buttocks. Not that one should find this disgusting. On the other hand, uh, the contrary. Uh, but not, let's not confuse the no's with the yeses. This sort of schizophrenia also produces various crises as to sexual identity, behavior, and doubt as to what one's sexual inclination should be. To augment this, recently more and more American films are promoting the absolute equality of homosexuals, transvestites, heterosexuals, and the good old traditional types. Uh, What one does in his bedroom is of no interest to any of us. However, this is being promoted as normal. The propagandistic effect of the screen works catalytically against human dignity, my friends and the dignity of nature that wants to reproduce. Subsequent to this state of confusion as to what is right or abnormal, what is normal, what is abnormal, and what is wrong or normal, are the rapes, sexual perversion, and other relative psychosis, all of which thrive in a society that has never been initiated in the concept of the word eros. Nor does the American family come out untarnished from such a corrosive, social infrastructure. The escalating crime rate in primary and elementary schools where we hear of shootings quite often, even more more often lately. The young resorting to drugs and the social abandonment of senior, senior citizens in a state of wretchedness and loneliness and of the infinite loneliness. That the, uh, the, these all reflect the absence of the meanings of love that the West is devoid of. The ugly American divorces are now commonplace phenomena with the children being the direct recipients of its repercussions, as they grow up at the mercy of television without storyi, familial love. As the parents either work interminably or uh, to fulfill their consumer needs, or thrash about in the unbearable lightness of their cultureless being. Without maternal affection, there has been an ever-increasing number of young men in English-speaking countries and in French-speaking countries lately, uh, especially in the U.S. and Britain, though, who marry women much, much older than themselves, as they are searching for the mother figure whose affection they may have never enjoyed. I would not have deemed it necessary to mention all the above, my friends, if the course that humanity has taken towards globalization did not have as a role model this kind of civilization, in quotation marks, civilization euphemistically, civilization, which is spreading throughout the planet like an all-encompassing cancer cell, lately merging with the misanthropic mindset of some Middle Eastern cultures which have permeated the West, establishing enclaves of a desert mentality which never developed enough humanism to treat each other humanely, especially their women. As As things stand, What is being established is a globalized world devoid of Greek concepts of love, rendering societies oblivious to the real values of life, which can only be embraced within the institution of family. And since this institution is not conducive to the consumer society that the big banks want to establish for maximum profits, gains, throughout the planet, it has sustained all the slander and discouragement Uh, the TV and movie screens can launch. Ever since a McDonald's has opened up in Beijing, for instance, the words farmer and traditional and family man have become mock words in China. While all the more bicycles are being trashed for new cars, and let's imagine the environmental consequences uh, with a car to every China man. This is all too evident in Greece itself, I must say, where over a 40-year period of exposure to the demoralizing culture of Western mass media, the Greeks also seem 
to have lost sight of these grassroots values, especially in urban areas. Is there a solution, you might ask? Well, it is all too apparent. As long, this is what I'm trying to do through these videos. As long as there is memory left, there's also hope that if more and more of us realize what is happening and invoke mnemosyne, the titanus mnemosyne, which means memory in Greek, the mother of the nine muses, the cornerstone of civilization, hence museum, as I've mentioned in previous videos, we may once again reinstate the values that once made us more human. Everyone will definitely find something more down-to-earth, more humanely substantial in the roots of his or her culture. Greek is not the only culture. Our planet is a wonderful place, and all the indigenous cultures have something to offer. And if we cling on to these cultural elements that unite people into nations once more, rather than this thinned-out uh, quagmire that the world is turning into, we will find these elements that will humanize us. Well, may you pick up what you have, clear off the dust, and submit it to your city as a politis hoplitis, citizen warrior, uh, who, unlike a subject, will not be led to cultural oblivion, so as not to end up consuming whatever is being peddled by his uninterested sovereign which is none other than the world banks. As a Greek, from my cultural perspective, I submit all that has been dictated to me by the memory of my language and by my consciousness as it has been formed by the world of ancestral dreams. Along with the concepts of harmony and minimosini, I also place on the altar of human dignity the Greek notions of love which I mentioned above and offer distillation of my written word and my spoken word, I say written word because I'm coming up with a book, it'll be published in a couple of months, uh, to the god Eros, in hope that his power will unite the compatible, I say compatible elements that may salvage harmony in our world. And compatible is the key word, not incompatible, because as I've stated before, we have compatible mixtures of chocolate and milk, make the fine text, produce the fine texture of milk chocolate. But when you take milk and vinegar, then you've got vomit. Okay, And this is what the world is doing. It is indiscriminately mixing things up in a way that the quagmire is not going to be welcome in any human palate. Thank you for listening.